This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 465. Seven Strategies to Clear Your Mind and Focus Like a Pro. Good morning, and welcome to this normally very peppy 5 a.m. Miracle podcast. I am Jeff Sanders, and this week, this podcast is not going to be about having your day being dominated before breakfast. Normally, I I like that, (laughs) but this week, we're going somewhere new. Yeah, you could wake up and bounce out of bed with enthusiasm, but let's try something a little bit different, a little slower, a little smoother. In the episode this week, I'm going to break down a few of my favorite tactics for reducing stress, thinking more clearly, taking notes in the shower, and my ultimate favorite strategy for clarity, focus, and peace. Let's dig in. If you've been feeling scattered, stressed, overwhelmed, I'm with you. Uh, My life now is busier than ever, which means I need simple strategies to slow down, to clear out the madness. If you've experienced anything like I have, which I'm sure you have, you know that the busy times in life make it clear just how valuable slowness can be. How much we need this time. This time to chill, to embrace margin, to forget the to-do list, to forget all the noise that consumes us each and every day. I think that, I'll speak for myself here, but I've fallen victim to that trap. The trap of checking boxes. The trap of just doing because that's what I've been doing. So I do more. And more. And more. But to what end? That's the question. So to help clarify that, to find some clarity, some simplicity, some Direction. Let's discuss these seven strategies. I'm going to raise my voice a little above the uh, <laughs> the low timbre that I had going here. And let's get back to a little bit more of the norm. And by more of the norm, I mean let's focus on the practicality here. The strategies that are actionable, that are helpful, but ones that hopefully will not add to that checklist. Ones that are not going to hopefully increase the scatteredness, the stress, the overwhelm. No, instead we're going in a different direction and we're going to look for solutions. Simple, clear solutions to finding that clarity, reducing that stress, to feeling like, yeah, I've got this. I'm ready for this. I'm at peace. I feel whole. It's tough to get there. Like I'm saying this out loud like I've somehow achieved it. (laughs) And I think that more than anything, I'm right there with you. Hopefully you're there with me, that you know what I'm talking about. The day-to-day, the rat race, the monotony, the hamster wheel, the endlessness of the tasks, the calendar, the projects. That, you know, that thing, the thing I normally love so much and still do, but that thing that can take over. And then where are you in all of that? Where is your sense of clarity if the next thing just takes over and you become reactionary? You become reactive in a way that says, I'm just going to look and do and execute, and go, and move, and twist, and bend, and jump, and whatever I have to do to make it all work, 
And that's when it all just kind of falls apart, right? The fatigue, the exhaustion, the eventual, probably a burnout at some point. My second book, The Free Time Formula, it talks all about my own burnout, the panic attacks, the trips to the ER, seeing doctors, seeing gastroenterologists, seeing neurologists, eventually having back surgery because, well, I had a slip disc, but don't kid yourself. Stress was all over that. So I've been there. I know what it feels like physically, emotionally, psychologically. Stress is dangerous. It is. It's extremely dangerous. So having strategies, having solutions to these problems, oh, it's, it's magical. It's miraculous, if you will. Maybe not at 5 a.m. all the time, but there's a miracle in there somewhere. So let's get to these seven strategies. I, I wrote these things down with the intention of reflecting strategies in my life that I use, many of them all the time. Uh, some of which I only use on occasion, um, others I only use on an as-needed basis, but they're all here uh, at your disposal to take advantage of them if it makes sense for your life. Like I said, I don't want to add to your checklist here, but what I do want to provide are solutions. If you're experiencing that level of intensity, that stress, well, there's a pretty good chance you don't want to feel that way. And you'd like to do something about it or have some of that weight lifted off your shoulders. If that's where you are, great. If that's not where you are right now, maybe you're in a great place. And what I'm talking about here uh, isn't relevant to your life right now. Um, Unfortunately, I have some bad news for you, which is that at some point it will be. You're going to have a day where this speaks to you. And when it does, just come on back. Come on back and check it out. It'll make sense. All right, strategy number one. If your goal here is to clear your mind and to focus like a pro, well, number one, make it easy to record your thoughts at all times, no matter where you are or what you're doing. There's something that I've been doing for years now, probably dating back to when I was in high school which is to carry a pen with me at all times. I've done that uh, primarily because I saw a need to record all kinds of things, ideas that I had, uh, the next grocery list, or I just needed a pen to fill out a form. Whatever the case was, I got into the habit of having a pen in my pocket at all times. And I still do that even today, right now. I have a blue, uh, amazing little ink pen, the exact brand here, uh, this is the Bic Velocity 1.6. So if you're interested in uh, very generic pens that work pretty well, <laughs> there you go. But I've carried this pen with me for a very long time because I want to record my thoughts. If my goal is to clear my head, it means this is the key of the whole episode right here. If the goal is to clear your mind, your mind has to be clear. What that means is you're not carrying thoughts with you in your like front conscious mind all the time, or even in your subconscious, the goal here is not to use your brain as a vessel to store things. Yes, long-term storage for memories and skills, those are wonderful. But the day-to-day, the minutia of your next task, your next project, your next whatever, or even your thoughts, your fears, your uh, inclinations that just come about, Throughout the day, those things can by themselves be overwhelming and exhausting. And if you carry a pen with you, a physical pen to write things down, that's part of the solution. Of course, on top of that, you can use a recording app probably on your phone. Uh, Could be iPad, could be a computer, but a recording app. So wherever you go, you can jot down a note that you can refer to later. I use this Every single day, my number one app that I use is my task manager, Nozbe. That's N-O-Z-B-E. I've used it for, oh man, seven or eight years now. 
It's my go-to task manager. It's also the number one place where I record new ideas every day. So I jot down that note into my app on my phone, and I refer to it again later that day. Another idea is to activate a hands-free voice assistant on your phone to record ideas with your voice in the car or other places. I don't tend to use this one very often, but probably around once a week or so, um, I'll get an idea while driving, and then I'll use my hands-free, usually it's Siri, on my phone. I will have Siri record a note note for me. Um, There's another trick to this that I actually integrate with with Nosebe, my task manager. So I actually have Siri send an email uh, to someone that I call Jason Taylor. Uh, It's a made-up name that's tied to an email account that I get from Nosebe that will then take that email subject line and turn it into a task. If all of that sounds too complicated, don't bother. Just use a voice recorder or some kind of a simple hands-free voice assistant to jot down a note when your hands are busy. Another idea here is to add a simple pen and paper notepad to your nightstand uh, at your bedside. So in the middle of the night, if you've got an idea, you write it down. Uh, I have not done this as much recently as I did a few years ago, but there were a few seasons of my life where the notepad next to my bedside was essential because I would get ideas at three o'clock in the morning and I'd write them down. And the next day I would deal with it. Sometimes I would actually get up and go work on the idea in the middle of the night. I tend to only use that option if I'm stressed. If there's something really on my mind that I just need to solve right now, then I'll do so right now, whenever that happens to be. Fortunately for me, that's fairly rare these days. And the final idea here to easily record your thoughts is to add a waterproof notepad In all the areas where you need a waterproof notepad, uh, the primary use here is your shower or bathtub, a place where you might be every day, but a place where you want to record those notes. Um, I actually tend to use my own waterproof notepad every single day in the sauna at my gym. So sauna gets to be around 190-ish degrees Fahrenheit. It's very hot. You get very sweaty. And a waterproof notepad is essential for recording the thoughts that I get while I'm there. And I use it every day. I take notes every single time I go to the sauna because there's nothing else going on. I have no phone with me, no TV, no distractions. It's just me being very sweaty and writing down ideas that pop into my head if I get them, which is most of the time. If you go to a steam room or a hot tub or some kind of a place where you need a waterproof notepad, definitely bring one. Uh, They are, they're so great. And I'll include a link in the show notes page for the one that I've moved to. Um, I used to use a brand called Aquanotes that I used in my shower. Uh, To my best knowledge, they do not have that available anymore, but I will uh, make sure the the show notes reflects uh, the current uh, options available for you. All right, so there's some ideas for you if you want to easily record your thoughts no matter where you are or what you're doing. Uh, To quickly review those items one more time, uh, carry a pen, use a recording app on your phone, use the hands-free assistant, have a notepad by your nightstand at bed, and of course, a waterproof notepad wherever you need waterproofing. Number two idea to clear your mind is to schedule recurring brain dump sessions. Uh, The term brain dump I find kind of bizarre and weird, but what it really does stand for is what you think it is, which is releasing the thoughts from your head. Like I was just discussing a few minutes ago about this idea of needing to get thoughts out of your conscious mind because we want to store things in our brain all the time. You want to think and be creative and, and think critically with our brains and let the memorization and the storage of data be in a different device that's not our heads, right? It could be on the computer or in a notepad, but it's not in your brain because your brain should be free to think and juggle thoughts and bring them together in a creative way. So if you have a lot of thoughts in your head, which you probably do, whether you realize it or not, You can then schedule recurring brain dump sessions to get those thoughts out of your head onto paper 
and experience the catharsis that that is, the therapeutic nature of just releasing. It's incredible. I I don't have the words to describe just the simple beauty of what it means to let these things go, but it's it's freeing. Uh, One way to do this is daily journaling. I'm not typically one to journal. Um, Honestly, if you want to know the truth, this right here, me talking to you on this podcast, this is as close as I get to journaling. This is as close as I get to freeing my own mind, letting thoughts out of my own head and saying them out loud. Uh, In this case, it's being recorded and others are listening to it like yourself, but you could do this for yourself by yourself. You don't need a blog. You don't need a podcast. You don't need a, a, a platform uh, to espouse your thoughts publicly. You can if that's helpful, but it's not required. What's required in this sense is just getting those thoughts out, allowing yourself to free your mind up. So daily journaling is potentially very effective. There is a strategy I used to use uh, for a while, um, but I find it kind of challenging. It's called Morning Pages. And it comes from a book. Um, I have to link to that in the show notes page as well. Uh, but this, the strategy of morning pages is one where you just do a brain dump for 15 straight minutes using pen and paper. This is not digital. It's not audible. You are writing down, physically writing down your thoughts in a stream of consciousness type of way. So you're just going to start writing when the timer begins and you write nonstop until the timer is done with the pure intention of just letting things go. Once again, you're writing down any thought you possibly could have on paper in a nonstop fashion for 15 straight minutes. I don't tend to like it for one simple reason, which is that my hand cramps up and it hurts. It's physically painful for me to do this. You may not have that same experience if you are able to write without the pain, but I just found it to be like a hand cramp would just kick in and I'd be, I'd be done. But the experience was still helpful and you can do this digitally. Um, the intention behind this practice is to do it physically. Um, but if typing is as helpful for you as writing, um, try that as well. Another idea here is to utilize weekly brainstorming. So if you have a major problem you want to solve, this is where I've used this the most. Um, Let's take, for example, like I'm in a phase right now of my business where I just finished a project. I'm about to choose my next one, and I'm not totally confident which one I'm going to pick. And so to help clarify that, I typically use things like brainstorming where I will write down a question on a whiteboard at the top of the whiteboard, you know, what's my next project going to be? or what's the most profitable use of my time, or whatever the phrasing is I want to use. And then I will spend 30 to 60 minutes just allowing myself to write down every possible idea I have without a filter. The intention of this process, once again, is to write down everything you're thinking. And you're not filtering. You're not rejecting ideas. You're not going to tell yourself no. It's exactly the opposite. It is 100% put it all out there. You can filter later. The point of this activity, the point of this process is not to generate good ideas. It's to generate lots of ideas because among those many ideas, a few will stand out at the end that are clearly the best. And then you just forget the rest and that's it. So this practice to schedule recurring brain dump sessions Um, done in a variety of ways, uh, can help you to physically, mentally, emotionally process the thoughts in your head, get them out of your head, onto paper, onto a whiteboard, into your phone, onto your computer, um, just out and somewhere else. It's very helpful. Third strategy, to clear your mind and focus like a pro. This is when we get to my favorite strategy, the one that I pitched at the top of the show. Number three is to spend long stretches in nature. My personal favorite strategy for clarity, focus, and honestly, execution at the highest possible level is to spend time in the woods, generally on a long hike or potentially a long trail run 
However, the trail run aspect becomes more about the physical nature of exercise, whereas the hike, the primary focus of the hike is not fitness. My goal of hiking is these brain dumps, this mind clearing activity to just spend some quality time outdoors. And I always feel better after these sessions. They could be as little as 20 minutes or as long as three or four hours. I just need enough time for me to feel like something has transformed in my mind and it doesn't take long. Sometimes in just a matter of minutes, I'm already connected and feeling better. Nature is powerful. If you don't spend enough time literally in the woods by yourself, lost in a daze, oh, you got to try it. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Uh, this is one of the things that this is back in my early 20s. I had a realization that I was less of an extrovert as I thought that I was. And I've come to the conclusion now that I'm more of an extroverted introvert. So my nature by default, like on an, any given day, is actually to be alone, which if you know me might sound kind of weird. Like, well, Jeff, you're a public speaker. You're a podcaster. You're talking to other people all the time. You have you know, a wife. You have kids. You have friends, family. You're social. What about you as introverted? And the answer is my best ideas, my best energy, my some of my best parts of my day are spent alone. And that's just the truth of who I am and how I experience my life. And yes, there's a big part of me that is more extroverted, sure. But these long hikes in nature, this time alone in the woods, oh, it's so powerful. It's incredible what can be achieved when you give your mind the space to breathe. That rhyme, that's a really good tweet right there. So uh, write that one down if you want to uh, Yeah, give me credit later. Anyway, uh, so yes, long hike is great. The next thought would be camping slash mountaineering. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, thanks to being a Boy Scout and later on an Eagle Scout, uh, lots of time in the woods uh, doing campouts, usually against my will. I didn't really like Boy Scouts that much. I respect and appreciate it more now, uh, but as a teenager, I thought it was kind of silly. But as an adult, I can tell you that that experience was profound in a number of ways. And the camping slash mountain climbing that I've now done as an adult is phenomenal. It's incredible what can happen when you spend an extended period of time out in the woods, days or even weeks on end, disconnected from technology, from other people, from your normal day-to-day rhythm to just be outside for that long. It'll change you. It'll change your philosophy, change your perspective, change your mood, change so many things. And yes, it will clear your mind like you've never had it cleared before. So if you really need something significant, if you're in a tight space right now, I would suggest finding first kind of the day-to-day rhythm of these kind of daily hikes, daily journaling, those activities. But as quickly as you can, get yourself gone, right? Get yourself into the woods for three or four days. You could do so in a cabin. It doesn't require sleeping on the ground in a tent. Uh, you can do so in a variety of ways that are still more modern, but the intention behind it is to be out there in the woods. Uh, if you can do it, do so alone or with one other person, uh, you don't need to go with a large group. I would say a smaller group or solo is best here, but enough for you to be able to say, you have the chance to experience this, the chance to clear your mind, the chance to focus like you've never focused before. So that's number three, long stretches in nature. Now, I will tack on to that probably the most obvious uh, strategy in all of this, which is meditation. I don't have a specific note here about meditation, but it is one that comes up Um, as a strategy to clear your mind because the intention behind meditation is a simplistic focus, usually on the breath, for 15 minutes, an hour, however long as you do it. I have never found meditation to be as personally effective at mind clearing. I have found meditation to be more helpful for a variety of reasons, usually just bringing down the temperature right? Usually just like de-stressing or taking a few minutes to just pause before I move on to the next thing. 
there is value in this. Uh, but I would say you want to find your version of meditation. My experience with this has been that I've tried to meditate in a variety of ways, many of which have not been effective for me long term because it never quite settled with me. It never quite said this is my thing. Now, with all these ideas I'm mentioning today, many of them will not be your thing. You may think that being outside in the woods for a long time is just ridiculous, and that's fine. You don't have to love it, but you want to find something for you that you do love. And if meditation works for you, then make it work for you, right? There's a, a topic on this podcast I've discussed before, a person named Wim Hof, who has an entire, uh, I guess, brand and business model now built on a very active form of meditation, a deep breathing and cold therapy methodology that ultimately is a very aggressive form of meditation. And it's actually one that I have found more helpful than most because I really feel like something's taking place, like I'm doing something. Uh, I'm that kind of guy, right? I'm the action productivity checklist guy who likes to feel like something's taking place. So if you need that too, if you need to feel like your time is being used wisely and you don't want to waste time in that sense, well, then find something that allows you to experience that level of connection. And if an active form of meditation is that solution, well, then do that. And I would tack on to this one additional point. Uh, there is a, a book that I read a while ago. I believe it's called Breath by James blank. I forgot his last name. Anyway, I'll once again link to in the show notes. Um, this book uh, called Breath, that is what it's called, focuses on the history of breathing, the value of breathing. James Nestor, that's his name. There it is. Okay. Uh, it's a phenomenal book. And what I took from it was a deep appreciation for the breath, for breathing. And you may think, well, that's who cares, Jeff? Like, why is that important? Uh, well, first of all, if you change the way you breathe, which you can do a lot, you'll change your level of stress. You'll change your level of clarity. You'll improve how you experience your day to day. Right? Meditation, yoga, even exercise, even all of these activities are things that directly affect how you breathe, how fast you breathe, how deep you breathe, how much you focus on the breath. All of these things are very breathing centric. And the more that you understand the breath and the power that it has, especially nasal breathing, the more power you have to control your emotions, your level of stress, your focus, your clarity. All of these things can be improved when your breathing improves, which is why, you know, the episode just last week, I mentioned that I had a sinus infection. Well, if you don't already know, I still do this week as well. And one of the things that I have been unable to do uh, during this sinus infection is to breathe through my nose properly. And one thing that is absolutely fascinating is that when I read uh, the book Breath, oh, I think it was two years ago, it was two years ago in the fall, I began to tape my mouth shut at night. Yes. So while I sleep, I am only breathing through my nose because I have a little piece of surgical tape on my lips to close my mouth in a gentle way that I can easily get around. If I need to open my mouth to breathe, I can, right? There's no risk here to me like choking to death. Um, that is a possibility. So don't take this thing too lightly. You want to be careful here, but there is a, a very logical way to do this, to breathe through your nose at night while you sleep, which I have done 95% of the nights in the last two years. So yes, every single night I tape my mouth shut and sleep. My point here is that breathing matters, meditation matters, being in nature matters, all of these things matter, and they're all related. They're all related, and they all come back to this very simple methodology of a focus on focus, a focus on slowness, a focus on doing the next logical thing because it's the next logical thing, not because you feel like your life is on fire and you have to just move at a thousand miles an hour all the time.
You know, one thing that I'm doing right now in this moment that I didn't mention at the top of the show that I probably should have is I changed the the ambiance of this podcast this week. I began the show with some softer music and my tone is much calmer. My voice is much lower. The lights in my studio right now are all turned off. I'm recording this episode in the dark. The only light that I have is my computer screen. I'm doing so for a couple of reasons. One was that I needed to bring my own energy down a bit. And I also wanted to make sure that when I deliver this content to you, I was going to bring a different energy to the episode. You can do the exact same thing for the thing you're focusing on. If you're experiencing stress, if you're experiencing intensity and things are just moving too fast, you can slow down your life in a number of ways. One of which is to simply turn the lights off. (laughs) <laughs> literally you could i mean most people when they, when they meditate as a good example of this you may meditate in a room that's uh, that's dimmer the lights are brought down sometimes even turned off completely with the intention of it being a calm atmosphere and darkness that stillness that happens then well that that brings about a new version of you one where your heart rate begins to lower your blood pressure begins to lower, and your mind can then slow down, simplify, and execute one thing at a time. It changes you. It changes your emotions. It changes your hormones. It changes the next thoughts you're going to have, some of which may be more intelligent, more mature, more appropriate for your next thing to go and and focus on. My intention here saying is that I'm recording, yes, in the dark right now, but you can do the same thing, and I think you should. At least try it out. (laughs) Okay. The fourth strategy to clear your mind and focus like a pro is one that I've already alluded to, but we're going to go a little deeper into it now, is embracing deep sweating. So I mentioned this idea of the sauna before as a place that I go every day, and I usually take notes when I'm there, the waterproof notepad. Okay, what's actually taking place here is that I have a recurring uh, scheduled event on my calendar, five days a week, sometimes more, but at least five, uh, where I take my daughter and I to our gym here in Nashville, and she goes into daycare and I go to the weight room. I lift weights. And then I go to the sauna. So the exercise, the fitness element is baked into me lifting weights. But the sauna element, that thing I do at the end of the workout, it's incredible on so many levels. And I've I've wanted to do for a long time an episode of this podcast purely about the sauna. uh, But I've I've always held off because I don't feel like it deserves that much attention. But it it may. We'll we'll see. My point here is, is that the sauna or a steam room Uh, Both of them can work in tandem here as a place for you to go to just sweat, to just deeply sweat. It will release tension, stress, anxiety. It it releases all of this, yes, actual physical sweat and possible toxins and other things may come out of your body, but it's this emotional release, this deep sense of relaxation that takes place that is so profound. And I don't experience this through anything else, not through running, not lifting, not swimming, not riding a bike, like nothing replaces just a simple sit in a hot room and sweat experience. It's an incredible thing. So if you have access to something like that, a sauna or steam room, um, and and when I say sauna, I mean a traditional sauna, not an infrared, Uh, those are effective and I've used those in the past. I can tell you just if you do the research on this, the science behind the sauna, a traditional sauna, which uses hot rocks or just a heater, um, those are the most studied and the most effective. Infrared saunas are typically less effective and take longer to get the same level of of health benefits if you ever get there at all. Um, If you want to learn a whole lot more, Dr. Rhonda Patrick is a phenomenal resource on the sauna. I'll link to her as well in the show notes. I've learned a ton 
about sauna from her, and it's wonderful. But my point about this, as it relates to your mind being cleared, is that when you experience, let's say it's 20 minutes in a sauna or a steam room, 20 minutes of just sitting and sweating with no technology, just you sitting and sweating. Ah, the tension is released, the stress is down, and your mind is just free. What I experienced after the sauna is what I would almost call like a blank-minded experience. Like, I don't have thoughts in my head anymore. Whatever I was thinking about before, whatever is on my mind potentially bothering me, it just, it just fades away. Now, it may come back later, it probably will, but... The sauna gives you that chance to just let that stuff go. And if, of course, you would write down any ideas you have while you're there, it's also helpful. Now, along that same line, exercise plays a big role in deep sweating and mind clearing. Yes, before I said hiking or trail running, um, you can get a similar experience through lifting weights or swimming or yoga. Really, any physical activity is going to force your mind to focus on the physicality of what you're doing, potentially even pain you may be experiencing. Pain is an incredible focus activator, right? Pain provides your mind somewhere to go. I heard this uh, phrase earlier. I'm not sure who it was from, uh, but someone, I think it was on a podcast, someone was talking about how anger is a stronger, more attractive emotion than sadness. And the point they were making was that we as people tend to enjoy, literally enjoy being angry more than we enjoy in any sense of the word sadness or depression. The point being that if you have something that is making you upset, uh, and I don't mean things like politics or things you may see in the news, I'm talking more like personal things, things that directly affect you on a day-to-day basis. We tend to be the kinds of people, us as human beings, to find things to focus on in the negative that we can be angry about, and we'd rather focus on that than on things that make us sad. And what happens, from my perspective, this is just my philosophy here, my take on this is that when we focus on the anger, when we focus on why we're upset about something, we give ourselves an excuse. We are actively playing the victim. We're actively playing this role of somebody else messed up and it's their fault that I'm mad about it. Look how angry I am. I'm that kind of person. If you don't know that about me, I tend to be the kind of person who gets angry and likes to throw things, sometimes physically, like not just metaphorically, like actually throw things. And knowing that about me, I mean, obviously this podcast tends to be extremely positive and upbeat. And yes, that is who I am most of the time. But I have bad days too. And my bad days are really bad. They're extremely intense. And so I need this. I need the sauna. I need the exercise. And I need episodes like this one where I turn the lights off and I just calm down. If you're a high achiever, like I believe that you are, and you're a goal achiever, and you are an ambitious person, and you want bigger things for your life, well, what tends to come with heightened emotions are heightened emotions. If you're extremely positive, you could easily switch to being highly negative. Those things tend to come one after the other, right? If you're kind of blasé mood, like things aren't really that exciting, nothing bad, nothing good well, then you're probably not going to experience this or really care about what I'm talking about here. But if you're the kind of person who gets the high highs and the low lows, you can jump from one extreme to the next very quickly. Then times and strategies and experiences like this to be in a sauna, to be in a steam room, to, uh, to exercise vigorously. Well, these things are so valuable to clear your mind, calm yourself down, give you that sharper perspective on the next most logical, mature, and intelligent choice moving forward. All of this is extremely powerful when it's done on a regular basis. One of the things that I've seen that is more clear now than it ever was before is that exercise, 
And these types of habits are so much more powerful when done on an an actual daily basis. I don't mean five days a week. I mean seven days a week, a daily basis of choosing something that you're going to stick to without exception. Now, there are very few things in my life that actually hold true seven days a week. But when I stick to a schedule like that, if it's something like going to the sauna, lifting weights, or just doing push-ups, right? whatever the thing is you choose to do that every single day I'm going to do this, it is profound. The compound effect of those things over time is absolutely life-changing. So if you want to embrace these deep sweats, if you want that experience of changing your life physically, mentally, emotionally, commit now to daily fitness. It honestly, above all things else, I was doing this before, actually. I was thinking back to an episode that I did when I turned 30 years old. And there's that's episodes in this podcast as well. And I was giving advice to those in their 20s. And I, I forget now if I even mentioned this, this topic or not, but this thought hit me in, in, in the head earlier this week, which was that if I was to look back at people who are about to turn 40, let's say, because <laughs> I'm, I'm nearing there myself, and I wanted to give advice to someone who is now in high school, college, early 20s, mid 20s, early 30s, if or e- even older than that, it doesn't even matter. Fitness is so valuable. Taking care of your body is so incredibly important. I, I I got out of sync during COVID. I got out of sync during the pandemic with my regular habits. And as I've brought those habits back with intensity, with this vigorous, ambitious focus, oh, it is epic. I find it it's so hard to explain just how absolutely guaranteed it is in my calendar now. It is inexcusable for me to miss a workout now. Even while I'm sick, by the way, even during this very active and obnoxious science infection. In fact, I've worked out harder in the last week than I have recently. It's that important to me and it's that valuable to me. It may not be to you, but I'd like for you to give that a shot and see how it could change your life as well. All right, the fifth strategy to clear your mind and focus like a pro is to talk with someone out loud about what you're thinking. I say this one specifically because after I got married, when Tessa and I were about our our mid-20s living in Nashville, we had some of our first jobs out of college and we were, you know, working as career people doing our thing, our nine to fives every day. And it was still fairly new for both of us. We would come home from these pretty intense days. At the time, both of us were working in education, and we would come home with these incredible stories, and we just want to tell each other these stories. Like, oh my gosh, you're never going to believe what I saw today at work. Oh my gosh, you're never going to believe what just happened to me today. Let me tell you about it. We had a lot of those talks, a lot of those. I mean, we still do today, uh, but I specifically remember those time periods being so Interesting because how how new it was for both of us to come home and want to spill our guts and to tell the other person what we were experiencing. And sure, part of it was here was here's a funny story I had at work today. Here's this goofy person I talked to, right? Here's this really weird scenario. But things began to shift over time. And it was, I need to talk to you today because today was stressful. Today was hard. Today was exhausting, and I need someone to hear my story. I need someone to listen to me as I just unleash all of these thoughts in an audible way. I need to get this stuff off my chest. In a very similar way to what I'm doing now for you in this podcast, but with these particular talks that Tess and I would have, and still do uh, (laughs) very frequently, uh, it becomes this very therapeutic relationship building openness, openness of communication, openness of clarity, openness of let me just spill my guts and hopefully when it's all over, I'll feel better because I said something out loud without the need, by the way, for advice, without the need for 
uh, getting a solution to a problem. This is an interesting, I'm going really off topic here, but let me just go with it for a second. I have approached my marriage uh, from what I have read as a fairly typical response that guys tend to have to girls or men to women or husbands to wives in that particular instance uh, for our relationship, which is that if Tessa were to come to me, and I, this is something we discussed before, if she were to come to me and say, you know, Jeff, I have this problem, my first thought is, well, hey, here's my solution for you. Here's the answer to your question. Here's me providing what you want. Well, no. <laughs> I was wrong then. I am probably wrong now. Um, what she wanted was someone to listen. What she wanted was someone to just be there as a soundboard for her to vent. I didn't need to provide an answer. I didn't need to solve her problems. She didn't want that. I thought she did. Because once again, I'm a very practical person. I'm a I'm a box, you know, a checker. I'm I'm a cross the T's, dot the I's, here's the solution, let's move on to the next thing kind of guy. And a lot of guys are like this. A lot of people are like this in general. Um, not necessarily just guys, but that's me. And that's been us for a long time, Tessa and I. But what she needed and what I've needed on a number of occasions is just to be able to say something. I don't need feedback. I don't need a response. I don't need someone to solve a problem. I just need to say it. And then once I do, oh, okay, I'm good now. Let's go on to the next thing. Sometimes it's all you need. Sometimes that's all it has to be. So if you need someone, get that someone. It's it's hard for me to say if you don't have one, how to find it. Um, I say that in a very selfish way that I've always had Tessa. Uh, the two of us met when we were 14 years old. Uh, she's been in my life for a long time. But if you have a significant other or a mentor or a close friend or a therapist or someone, a parent, a neighbor, literally anyone who will listen to you talk, <laughs> get that person and talk. Say it out loud. Uh, my neighbor across the street, uh, he will love knowing he's on this podcast. Um, he's a talker. And he will flag down people to talk to them, sometimes strangers on the street, uh, and tell them things. Uh, it's hysterical. He's very charismatic and very open. Uh, but he needs to say things. And I get that. If you're in that place and you need to say things, then, then do so. Do what you need to clear your mind and get those things off your chest. Strategy number six, cancel everything all the time. This is my favorite strategy that I've discussed in this podcast more times than I can count because it is always true. When I can delete things, and I mean delete and never do them again, or cancel things like meetings or events, or throw things away, junk, trash, uh, things to the recycle bin, uh, things for donation, if I can eliminate things from my life, physical things, digital things, mental things, uh, psychological things, right? cleaning up your physical, digital, uh, metaphorical spaces, right? when you can cancel things, eliminate things, trash things, dump things, release things, oh, goodness, that's the whole process, right? That's what we're talking about, this whole thing. It's about clearing your mind so you have the ability to focus. And so canceling things goes way beyond just simply looking at your calendar and deleting events that you've scheduled for whatever reason. Um, I do that too all the time, and it's great. But what I'm really talking about here is giving your, your mentality, your consciousness, the ability to think openly and clearly. And you don't always need to cancel your whole life to do so. You don't always need a retreat to the middle of the woods to do so. Those things are very clear and obvious in the sense that they cause that to happen. But my, my bigger question for myself and for you and for an average person on, on any given day is how do you achieve that without the retreat? How do you achieve that, that sense of clarity or peace or simplicity 
without having to give up your whole life for a few days or a few weeks or a few months. Can you, is it possible for you to experience that sense of clarity much more often, possibly every day? I don't know. Uh, I'm asking that question in a very real way. Uh, This is the kind of thing where I know from, from my own perspective, my own experience, that the act of canceling things or deleting things or throwing things away is a very, very direct way to eliminate a a thing in my life that I know if it's gone, I'm not going to have to deal with it. But then this is the key. Once it's gone, there's a void, right? A space that's now opened up, whether it's a physical space in your house, a digital space on your computer, a time space on your calendar. It's going to be filled with something. This is the nature of the beast. The nature of of our existence is that nothing's ever empty, ever. It's always refilled by something. And the question becomes, what is that thing for you? Is it intentional or is it unintentional? Did you purposefully fill that new void with something that is going to be very beneficial and significant to you? Or did it accidentally fill up with something because you did not take the time to purposefully and proactively fill that void in a way that's going to be meaningful and significant and progressive and helpful. These are challenges we face with every single act, you know, with every action we take, with every action we take to delete something, eliminate something, move ourselves closer to the right answer. We still have to be proactive in the sense of saying yes to the thing that matters most. So as much as I want to tell you the answer to your mind being clear is to delete things, the opposite is just as true, which is that when you focus on something you want, everything else that doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Everything else that you no longer need just flows away. In my recent book, I talked about the green pen strategy, which is the opposite of the red pen. The red pen meaning you're going to find mistakes and cut them. You're going to delete things, cancel things, throw things away that are trash. We let go of the bad stuff with the red pen. Well, the green pen is the opposite perspective. It's the the yin to the yang to ask the question, how do I find the thing that resonates with me, that draws me in, that's a magnet that pulls me towards it, that says this is the thing I'm supposed to be doing now? Well, then when we have that connection to the thing we want, well, the rest of the stuff is just noise. And it just fades away because we are epically focused on the thing we're after. Clearing your mind could be step one, and focusing like a pro is then the natural, logical step two. You let go of the noise, and you then focus on the thing you want, or you focus on what it is that you want, and the things that don't matter, the noise just goes away. You can do these things in both directions, either or, beginning or end, start with one and do the other. Right, Find the thing that you want, everything else falls away, or cut the stuff that doesn't matter, and the thing that you really need and want in your life is revealed. It's a really cool process, actually. I really enjoy this kind of just digging through the muck. Now, there's a TV show a long time ago that I loved uh, that was kind of depressing in a number of ways, but all about hoarders. And hoarders tend to be the kinds of people who just collect the junk in a very physical way we can all see. Well, all of us are hoarders in our own way. We are collecting junk somewhere in our lives. It may not be obvious, like a house full of trash. It may be digital on our computers or maybe in our heads. Maybe it's all in your mind that you're collecting this junk that needs to go. And then when it does, my goodness, you can then physically see it on the outside of who you are over time because you're the kind of person who has that clarity, who knows what they want, who then pursues it with direct focus. It will transform what you pursue, how you pursue it, who you pursue it with when the noise isn't there. So ask that question for yourself. How can you cancel as much as possible to dig down into that core, peel away the layers of the onion to get down to the core of the thing that matters most to you? Finally, 
the seventh strategy to clear your mind and focus like a pro is to do one thing at a time. This is the epitome of simplicity, is the direct action towards one thing. When in doubt, do less. When in doubt, do less. This is the drumbeat of this podcast, right? I I talk a lot about this show being ambitious and early mornings are awesome. And yes, all things are true. But at the end of the day, the morning routine that I have espoused since day one is not one that has been filled with read a book, do yoga, run 10 miles, call your best friend, right? Go run 10 more miles. Like it's, it's not a morning filled with a ton of activity. The morning routine I've espoused since day one has a singular focus. When in doubt, do less. Wake up and dominate your day before breakfast. And that domination comes from doing one thing. Doing one thing. And if that one thing is important and you get that one thing done, voila, your morning is achieved. That was the whole point. When you can clear your mind, the clarity will reveal simplicity. These things all come together in a package deal. The focus, the clarity, it's all the same thing. When the obstacles are removed, the clutter, the distractions, the, the junk, all that is left is the thing that matters. The simplicity, the focus, doing less. That's it. Now, you may be wondering, Jeff, after all of this talk, like, I get it. Okay, fine. Yes, cut the junk. Do the thing that matters. Well, Jeff, what's the thing that matters? <laughs> what is this thing that you're alluding to? Hmm. <sighs> well, <laughs> to answer that question, um, I don't have the answer to that question. And I don't because it's not my question to answer. It's yours. When we're talking about what this clarity is, I mentioned the word clarity a number of times here. What am I talking about? Right? What are we getting clear on? What is this next action? What is this next goal? It's your choice. This is where things become, I think, so intriguing when, it, when you think about like why someone pursues anything. Why would someone start a business, run a marathon, go to grad school, learn the guitar? Like Why would they do anything? It's because they want to, because they're drawn to it. They're magnetized towards it. They can't not do it. That's what we're going for for you. The, the, the answer to the question of what are you digging down to? What is the core of your onion? What are these layers going to reveal? They're going to reveal your purpose. They're going to reveal things that bring out the best in you. Things that allow you to be the most beneficial to everyone else because you're doing the thing that makes you feel the most alive. That's what this is. So no, I don't have the answer to the question of what career path you should take or what next best action to take or next project to pursue, but I just answered that question, didn't I? What you're drawn to is the thing. When in doubt, we're seeking that level of clarity. So all the stress, all the noise, bring this back to the top of the show, the stress and the noise and the, the burnout and the fatigue and the exhaustion, oftentimes all of that, like I mentioned in the episode just last week, is simply an example of us doing too many of the things that don't bring us life. They don't fill us up. They keep us busy, but they don't fill us up. And so if your stress is coming from the simple lack of activity on things you enjoy and you flip that script and then all of a sudden you spend even some time on something that fills you up and brings you back to life, then you'll find more of that time to do more of that thing as time progresses. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, you've just altered your entire life by spending so much more time on the things that make you the best version of you. And that's how this magical puzzle of life all fits together. It's goofy. It's crazy. It makes very little sense a lot of the times. But all of these strategies to de-stress, to find clarity, to focus better, they all lead to this simplicity of knowing your next move, knowing what your next focus will be, and being confident in that place to pursue it. 
Okay, now to review what those seven steps were one more time for these seven strategies to clear your mind. Uh, The first was to record your thoughts everywhere, all the time. Number two was to schedule recurring brain dumps, journaling and brainstorming. Number three, spend more time in nature, hiking, camping, mountaineering. Number four, embrace deep sweats, exercise, sauna, etc. Number five, talk with someone you trust and spill your guts to them. Number six, cancel everything you possibly can. And number seven, do one thing at a time. In lieu of an action step this week, we're just going to bring the energy back down to where we began. The episode this week was a little different. First, I would like to know if you enjoyed it, (laughs) if you found it valuable. You can email me anytime, jeff at jeffsanders.com. I love feedback. I love to hear from listeners just like you. And yes, that means you if you're hearing my voice right now. Uh, The second thing about why action is really not the point of the episode this week is that I gave you a lot to think about. And I want you to spend a little time digging into where you are right now. If what I mentioned earlier about stress, about burnout, about the intensity of what can happen when your life runs away from you. I said before that stress was dangerous, and I'm, I'm very serious when I say that. It is physiologically, mentally, emotionally, relationally dangerous. And I don't take that lightly here on this show. My focus, my intention, my strategy to deal with stress, as you've heard in this podcast before, is a very proactive one. It's one that's founded in action steps and project lists and task managers, which definitely is is great, but it's not the whole picture. There's a lot more to life than checking boxes. A lot more. So if you're in a place now where you need to slow the roll, to take a nap, to sit in silence, take that time now. Take a few moments. The length of this song I'm playing in the background right now is what, two, three minutes long? Sometimes it's all it takes. You're just going to let something sit. Let the emotions be what they are. And then let them go. Just let them go. It's hard, but necessary. And the payoff, it's beautiful. 